Well, good morning, church. Hey, we're so thankful that you've joined us this morning. Hey, listen, we're going to celebrate the risen Christ. And listen, this morning, the church is alive because Jesus is alive. He is alive and well. And we're going to celebrate that truth this morning. And so participate. Worship with us. Let's sing from the depths of our souls. Lift high the name of Jesus this morning.
Well, good morning, Heritage Church family. If you have your Bible, I invite you to open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I do want to say a special welcome to everyone who's joining us today on this Easter Sunday. Uh, for Christians, it doesn't get any bigger than Easter. This is the reason why we worship on Sundays. We remember that Jesus Christ rose from the dead over sin, death, and hell for our salvation. And we're excited this morning to consider that. But, you know, one of the most interesting aspects of Easter is the fact that it happened almost totally unnoticed. And as we think about Easter, don't you, don't you wish you could have seen a, some video footage of what happened? And I can't help but wonder, if it happened today, wouldn't there have been reporters lined up outside of the empty tomb with cameras and flashes and everyone waiting because Jesus predicted that three days later he would rise? But the amazing thing is that Easter, that first Easter morning, really happened in secret. God didn't announce what he was going to do. God didn't bring a crowd to see Jesus walk out of the tomb. But Jesus rose from the dead, and if it weren't for the faith and the faithfulness of those women who went to the tomb, the message might have never spread at all. But the amazing thing is this, those women went to the tomb, they saw that the Lord had risen, they heard what the angel said, he is not here, he has risen, go and tell. And that, that initial moment that began almost as a secret took root in their hearts, they went and told the disciples, and the message slowly grew, the message slowly spread, and the message slowly took root in the hearts and minds of people all over the world. And we're here today celebrating Easter because that message has spread to us. Jesus is alive. And as we think about that message, uh, in the early church, that message spread quickly. In the book of 1 Corinthians, as we're going to read in just a moment, it says that that message that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again was of first importance. And the Bible says that Jesus appeared to those women. The Bible says that Jesus appeared to the disciples. The Bible says that he appeared to hundreds more, to the brother of Jesus, James. And then Paul says that, that Jesus appeared to him as one untimely born. He appeared to Paul very last. And of course, we know the story of Paul. Paul was a persecutor of the church. It's even possible that he murdered Christians because he so adamantly believed the resurrection was not true. And yet, when Jesus appeared to him, it changed Paul's life. It changed his vision. It changed his future. And it changed his destiny. And we're going to look today at 1 Corinthians 15 as a message that this man who was a persecutor of the church wrote to those who had come to believe the truth that Jesus was alive. And this book, it's important for us to know, was written about 25 years, 25 to 30 years after the stone was rolled away, after that first Easter morning. Paul wrote to this Corinthian church, which was almost 2,000 miles away from Jerusalem by foot. He wrote to them about the meaning of the resurrection and how the resurrection continued to reverberate in their life. Not just an event, not just a moment in a single day, but the event, the moment upon which all history hangs. And Paul wrote, as the truth of the resurrection began to take root in their lives, he wrote to them because they were facing some confusion. You see, there were some people in the Corinthian church who were teaching that the resurrection was a myth, that the resurrection was an inspiring story, that the resurrection was something that was powerful in terms of thinking about life and death, but there were those who were creeping into that Corinthian church and they were saying, no, there is no resurrection from the dead. Maybe Jesus lives in our hearts, maybe his memory lives on, but the body does not rise. At which point, you have to almost chuckle, don't you? When Paul heard that this was being taught, he would have been the very last person you could convince that Jesus was still in the tomb. And so he wrote to these Corinthians, and he wrote to them to reassure them. He wrote to them to give them the sense of uh, this meaning, the power of the resurrection. And these are the words that we're going to read this morning, starting at the beginning of chapter 15. We're going to look there in verse 3 through verse 8, and then we're going to jump to the end of the chapter to consider the impact of the resurrection and how it continues to resonate in the hearts and the minds of believers. So I want to jump in to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to start there in verse 3. This is Paul speaking again against the lies that the Corinthians are being told. And he says this, for I passed on to you as of most importance what I also received. So I want you to think about this for a moment. Again, this is written almost 25 years, so only 25 years after Jesus rose from the dead. And Paul is saying, I passed on to you 
as of most importance what I also received. Scholars believe this is an early church tradition that might have developed even within a year of Jesus rising from the dead, that they began to formulate this message so it could spread more quickly in the world. This idea that Christ, he says, died for our sins according to the Scriptures, fulfilling what the Old Testament prophets had said, fulfilling what the Word of God said from the very beginning that the seed of the woman would stomp the head of the serpent. According to the Scriptures, Christ died He was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he gives a list. He appeared to Cephas, that is Peter. He appeared to the twelve. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive. And think about this for a moment. Paul is saying, don't just take my word for it. Don't take the word of one man who says he had a vision. Take the word of hundreds who are here, who are alive, who you can contact, who you can speak to about their experience of the risen Lord. But he says, some of them have fallen asleep. And he continues, then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, and last of all, as to one born at the wrong time, he appeared also to me. You see, Paul is very intent in grounding the faith of the Corinthians and grounding the faith of the church in history. We don't sing because we feel the presence of Jesus. We don't sing merely because we know He lives within our hearts. No, we sing because we believe that a literal body literally rose from the dead. That Jesus conquered sin, death, and hell, not metaphorically, but historically. That the sin of the world was paid for, and yet Jesus, three days later, rose bodily. And he stands even now in victory over sin, death, and hell. And so Paul teaches this to the Corinthians. He says it's not a symbol. It's not a good story. It's moving. It's inspiring. And maybe it's so inspiring that we can build our lives on it. But he says, no, it's not just that. Jesus is alive. And Paul can never be convinced otherwise. And as he continues on in this chapter, he has so much to say to the Corinthians about the meaning of the resurrection. He tells them, if Jesus isn't alive, we're still dead in our sins. If Jesus is not alive, then we're proclaiming lies about God. If Jesus is not alive, then we have no hope. Everything he teaches hinges on whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. And some of the the Corinthians, they had questions. Well, if Jesus rose from the dead with a new body, what does that mean for us? What does it mean for our body? At which point Paul begins to teach them that the resurrection body is not like our body. Our body is temporal. Our body is frail. But the resurrection body will be incorruptible, sown in dishonor but raised in honor, sown in corruption but raised incorruptible, sown in weakness but raised in power. And as Paul teaches this, he's reminding them, them of the power of God, that just as God created a body for Adam to live in this world, that he is going to create bodies for us on that resurrection morning that will be able to live with him forever. Jesus is the first fruits, and we, church, are the harvest that is to come. And as we think about these things, it's overwhelming, and we could spend so long teasing out the amazing truth of this passage, but what I want us to do is to look at the last several verses. We're going to start there in verse 50 and go down through verse 58 and unpack the meaning of the resurrection as Paul wraps it up in this crescendo of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Paul says, this is the point, this is what I'm getting at, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor can corruption inherit incorruption. He's saying here that resurrection is about the shedding of flesh and blood. Not not just the shedding in terms of laying aside these mortal quarrels, but the, the shedding of our old body, the shedding of that which is perishable, the shedding of that which is incorruptible. In other words, in order to be resurrected, we must be transformed. And as we think about Jesus' resurrection body, it's absolutely incredible because in one sense it was a body just like ours. We know that after Jesus rose from the dead, he ate, he drank, he was able to be touched physically. It wasn't a spirit body, he wasn't a ghost. His body was just as physical as yours and mine, and yet more so. You see, this body could walk through walls. This body could also ascend into heaven and be with the Father. This is a new body. He had to die so that what was old could be replaced, so that that seed could be sown and the new body could be given. 
And so Paul says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor can corruption inherit incorruption. Listen, I am telling you a mystery, he says. We will not all fall asleep. In other words, not everyone will die, but we will all be changed in a moment. And the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. In other words, our bodies, even those who are alive when Christ Jesus returns, must be transformed. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. And it's that word, that idea that I want us to focus on this morning. As we think about being clothed in immortality, as we think about the resurrection pressing us past this temporal and frail body to an incorruptible and immortal body, this morning I want us to see that the resurrection changes the way that we see eternity. Paul goes on to say this, when this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory, where death is your sting. When we think about this mortal life, when we think about our life on earth, we begin to realize, don't we, how very short it is. And in these times, perhaps more than any other, we realize our frailty. We realize that life is a gift that can be taken in any moment. And as we think about eternity for a moment, I believe that the resurrection changes the way that we view eternity. It changes the way that we see eternity. And as we think about our life, I want to think about the length of our life for a moment. The Bible says that our life is but a breath. And I think there are metaphors that we can use to understand our life and the vastness of eternity. Imagine for a moment that you went to a beach and you decided you went, wanted to go put your toe in the water. As you look out at the vast ocean, you see the vastness that your eye can't even take all in. And you know that that's just a drop in the bucket compared to the fullness of the ocean. But imagine for a moment that you go up to the shore and you get just close enough so that one wave brushes your toe. And in that moment, your toes are wet, but the wave recedes. Think of that wave, think of that one moment as your life in comparison to all eternity. That that moment that you got your toe wet and the moment that it recedes back is like your life compared to the ocean of eternity. Or imagine for a moment that you're on that same beach and you lift up a single grain of sand. And you look at that grain of sand as your life compared to all the vastness of time. You look down the beach and you know there are miles and miles and thousands of miles of beaches all over the world. But that tiny grain of sand represents your life and the vast sum of all eternity. And as we think about eternity for a moment, it's overwhelming. Our life is but a breath. It will soon be over. And yet, here's what Paul is saying. Our life here, our life today matters. The resurrection changes our view of eternity. Why? Because we recognize that this tiny sand grain of a life that we live is going to reverberate forever. That we are not temporal creatures, but we are eternal creatures. And that the resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees this hope in our heart that we will live forever. And as we think about eternity, as we think about all that it means, it does nothing less than make this life infinitely valuable. Do you know that every decision you make in this life will reverberate into eternity? Every good thing you do will be rewarded. Every evil thing you do will be punished, which is why we need the blood of Christ to atone for our sin, and we need the grace of Christ to even reward that which He brings about in our hearts anyway in the first place. This is the, 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 the dichotomy that is so difficult for us to imagine, but it's the reality that is so important for us to grasp. Our life matters. This life matters. And what we do will redound forever. Yes. The resurrection changes the way we see eternity. It's but a moment. But we know that this life is not all that there is. And if it were, that would change how we live, wouldn't it? 
Paul says so in this chapter. He says, if this life were the only one that we have, if this life, if this temporal moment, if this speck of time that we spend on earth were all that we have, then we would just live it up. We would live like every day was a feast. We would live like every moment was, was for our own enjoyment. It would be a YOLO life where we get as much as we can. We do as much with, with what we've been given. We use it for ourselves. We use it for our enjoyment. Why? You live you die, and that's all there is. But we know that's not true. And we know that's not true because of the resurrection. And because of the resurrection, it changes the way we see this speck of life. It's a gift to be used. It's a megaphone given to amplify the glory of God. You see, the resurrection changes the way we see eternity. Because it shows us that this life is not all there is. But as we look at this text, I love what Paul does. He tries to get us to glimpse into heaven. He tries to get us to glimpse into eternity, to consider the bodies that we'll have, to consider the life that we will experience. But as he does it, and as he parades this victory saying, oh, death, where is your victory? And oh, death, where is your sting? He immediately moves us from this idea of looking into eternity to looking at today. He says this in verse 56, the sting of death is sin, that is we have all sinned and therefore we all deserve to die. And the power of sin is the law, the idea that somehow we can live in our own righteousness and attain the favor of God. Paul says this is the lie that we've believed, this is the trap that we've been held in, but what in verse 57 does it say, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Christ Jesus our Lord. The victory that we experience is that death and sin and hell and corruption have all been defeated in Christ. And this doesn't just change the way that we see eternity. The resurrection changes the way that we see today. And I want you to look carefully with me at this next verse. Paul says in verse 58, Therefore, That therefore meaning because we have life eternal, because we have hope incorruptible, because we have victory over death, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast. Do you see the transition from eternity to day? Therefore, today, be steadfast. Be immovable. Always excelling in the Lord's work. Why? Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And this was so important for Paul. As we think about the life of Paul or we think about the life of the other apostles, what was it that changed them from people who, in Paul's case, were working against God or in the case of the disciples, were people who abandoned Jesus at the cross? What changed their mind? What changed their view? Not just of eternity, but of their life today. What changed it was the fact that Jesus is alive. And therefore, because Jesus is alive, they were motivated, they were inspired to make every moment in this world count for eternity. You see, the resurrection didn't just change the way they saw heaven. It didn't just change the way they saw eternity. It changed the way that they saw their life. And as we think about Paul, think about the depth of change that he experienced. He left behind his family. He left behind all those he had grown up with. He left behind all that had been valuable to him. Why? Because he said that he had found something more valuable. He had found a love that went to the cross. He had found a power that had raised Christ Jesus from the dead. He had found a life and a living hope in Christ Jesus that was greater than everything he had ever known. And so he says, in light of the resurrection, be steadfast. And I love that idea, that image of being rock hard, of not changing, of not moving with the winds and the waves of this world, but being so steadfast and immovable in our faith that nothing can rock us, nothing can change us. As we think about the waves of COVID-19, I look forward to the fact that the waves of COVID-19 will not break the rock of the church. Why? Because the rock of the church is built on Jesus. 
We may not be able to meet together, but we can praise the Lord together and we can proclaim His victory together. Why? Because COVID-19 may be here today, but the tomb was empty yesterday, the tomb is empty today, and the tomb will be empty tomorrow. Our hope is a hope that is steadfast. Our hope is a hope that makes our heart immovable and it moves us to continue to excel in the Lord's work. Why? Because we know that work is not in vain. Continuing to serve, continuing to love in the midst of hardship, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of pressure, not to speak, not to move, not to continue. We say the tomb is empty. We believe that Jesus is alive. But here's what's amazing. As we think about the empty tomb, I hope that in your heart, the Spirit is singing inside of you, resonating with the truth that Jesus is alive. But when it comes to believers, again, he says, excel in the Lord's work. And what oftentimes happens in the hearts of unbelievers is that we know that Jesus rose from the dead. But there's a disconnect between that knowledge of Jesus' resurrection and the way that we live our lives. And I want to look at a verse in 1 John chapter 3. This is speaking of the knowledge of Jesus. This is speaking of the awareness of Jesus. It says this, Everyone who has put this hope in Him, that is the hope that He is alive, the hope that He is returning, everyone who has this hope in Him purifies Himself just as He is pure. In other words, I want you to think about this carefully for a moment. Because Jesus is alive, That changes the way that we live. That changes our behavior. That changes our expectation. And as we think about this, it makes no sense to say that Jesus rose from the dead. It makes no sense to say that we believe that, but for us to continue to live in sin. And I'm going to just list a few things for you that will just make it sound just so unusual. But this is the way that sometimes Christian lives. Can, can, can you imagine a Christian that says this? I believe Jesus rose from the dead, but I still beat my wife. Or I believe Jesus rose from the dead, but I still lie to my husband. Or I believe Jesus rose from the dead, but I cheat on my taxes. Or I believe Jesus rose from the dead, but I don't take responsibility for raising my children. Or I believe Jesus rose from the dead, but I'm having an affair. Or I believe Jesus rose from the dead, but my tongue wags like a dog's tail. I believe Jesus rose from the dead, but I have no joy. I have no love. I have no peace. I believe Jesus rose from the dead, but I'm not going to be generous with what God's given me. I I believe Jesus rose from the dead, but I'll go to church when I feel like it. There are so many things as we examine our lives that we need to ask. Does our life match the fact that Jesus rose from the dead? We say we believe it, but our life belies it. And as Christians, we need to think about the way that the resurrection resurrection of Jesus impacts today. We need to think about the way that the resurrection of Jesus should impact our life and our heart. Instead of saying, I believe Jesus rose from the dead, but we should say like Paul, I believe Jesus rose from the dead, therefore, I will walk in faith. I believe Jesus rose from the dead, therefore I will love those who don't love me in return. I believe Jesus rose from the dead, therefore I will submit every area of my life to him. I believe Jesus rose from the dead, therefore I have joy unspeakable. This is what the resurrection does for those who understand it. It's a seed that's planted in our heart that continues to grow. It gives us the confidence to live for God every day in all circumstances. Not that darkness doesn't exist, but that we have a light inside us that's inextinguishable because Jesus rose from the dead. And so church, the resurrection changes the way we see eternity. The resurrection changes the way we see today. But in fact, the resurrection changes the way that we see everything. The resurrection is the event on which all history hangs. It reminds us that every single person in this world is an eternal being who has an eternal destiny. There is nothing in life the resurrection does not fundamentally change. It changes our view of dignity that God has declared your life and my life to be infinitely valuable in His sight. It changes the way that we view our body 
God has given you your body, and it will be raised and transformed. It changes the way that we view our family. That God has given us our family to love and to shape our hearts. It changes the way we view our purpose. That God has placed me here and now in this moment in 2020 to fulfill the plan that he had for me before the creation of the world. It changes the way that we view creation. The beauty of creation points to the freedom that God is preparing for all of us. It changes the way we view other people. That others too are infinitely loved by God even if they are our enemies. It changes the way we view our our Bible teaching us to live in accordance with what Christ told us. It changes the way that we view our money, that money is a temporal gift to be used for eternal purposes. It changes the way we view our abilities, that our abilities are given to us for a small moment so that we can serve others and lead them to God. It changes the way that we view the church, that the church is the community of the kingdom, the living evidence of God's reign on earth. It changes the way that we view our nation, that this is temporal and the the nation can give us stimulus checks, but the nation cannot give us one breath after we die it changes the way we view our God that God is the architect of the cosmos he's the architect of redemption he is the father who went to every length to bring us back to him and it changes the way we view death because of the resurrection our greatest enemy has now been forced into servitude And that he is a servant who will now usher us into the very presence of God. This is the power of God. This is the hope of the resurrection. This is not a moment in the past. This is a moment that reverberates to today. The power, the victory, the triumph, the love, the vindication of God shown on Jesus Christ that he is alive and in us that hope lives and will live forever. The resurrection changes everything. Jesus, the first fruits, us who are to be raised. If God is for us, then who can be against us? In church this morning, we celebrate in resurrection power that we believe that at this very moment, Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Ruling and reigning and stoking the fires of His Spirit so that we will live in the light of that reign. Church, it's not a metaphor. It's not a symbol. It is reality and is the deepest reality of all. And this was God's plan. Not only to love us, He always loved us, Not only to save us, but to give us a living hope that would empower us to live every day for Him. The resurrection changes everything. And that message may have had a slow start. No one was there to see Jesus walk out of the tomb. But because those women were faithful, They received the word that like a seed was sown into the hearts of the disciples and like a seed was sown into the heart of Paul and like a seed was sown into the heart of those Corinthians and that same seed is in us. The secret out is out. The word is spreading. In church this morning, That message is for us. So let's make sure it takes root. And let's make sure that today, on Easter Sunday, we let the truth of the resurrection change us. To be steadfast, immovable, walking the path that God has led us to walk this day, this time, for his glory. Church, the tomb is empty. Let's be the people who tell the world. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much 
for the resurrection of Jesus. Thank you for the power that we have coursing through our veins. Thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have for eternity, but also for this moment, for this time, that you have given us the inextinguishable light, and we are called to share that with the world. Lord, I thank you that our hope is not based on myth. Our hope is not a mere symbol. But we believe that just as Jesus rose, you will raise us. And Lord, one day we will see you face to face because we have this living hope. Lord, give us the strength to walk it out in the great and powerful name of Jesus, Lord. Thank you that today we worship because he lives. And we pray it in Jesus' name.
There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. Thank you again for joining us online at Heritage Baptist Church and for Easter Sunday. We're reminded that we serve a risen Savior, that He is victorious over all things, even in this time of uncertainty. Church, we want you to really know that we miss you and miss the opportunity that we have to meet together, and we look forward to meeting together again real soon. Have a great rest of your day. He is risen. 